Amen. Sango Bible Church exists to love God and love people. And we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Matthew chapter 22, Mark chapter 12, and Luke chapter 10. And all together, collectively, they say, you shall love the, God, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That is love God. Then it also says to love our neighbor as yourself. That's love people. And so by loving God, God's kingdom is growing in us. By loving people, God's kingdom is growing through us. The issue, though, is our sin and our life experiences. Our sin and our life experiences hinder us from furthering God's kingdom. We know for sure sin does. All sin cripples us from furthering God's kingdom. Our self-interest comes to the forefront and it stops us from being Christ-like. Now, along with sin is our life experiences. And what I mean by that is everything that has shaped us, our childhood, our parents, or lack of parents, or our single parents, our families, our past and current churches, our past and current jobs, everything God has, uh, God, God has uh, in our life experiences, that has all shaped us in the way we think, the way we talk, the way we raise our children, homeschool, public school. It, it does everything to us. It, it shapes us in the way we react. It shapes us in the way we enjoy things. All of this can shape how we further God's kingdom. Most of the time, it hinders us from furthering God's kingdom. Paul in Romans chapter 8, 28 says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Meaning everything that you and I experience, everything, our fears, our doubts, our strengths, our creativity, our brokenness, our sin struggles, our victories, the worst part of our lives, the best days ever in our lives. God works them all together for his good, for his glory. So today, what we're going to do, and for the next couple weeks, we're going to do something a little bit different here at SBC. Typically, we open our Bibles to a book in the Bible, and we just go verse by verse until the end of that Bible, until the end of that book. And so the past couple series, we did Malachi for about eight weeks. We did Haggai for four weeks. In, in four weeks, we're going to be jumping into the Gospel of Matthew to like, for like six years. That's how long that the Gospel is. But until then, we're going to do a short series on the biblical characteristics who God calls and uses to further his kingdom. Essentially, they're kingdom workers. And so today, our first kingdom worker we're going to see goes by the name of Gideon. Raise here if you've heard of the story Gideon. Yes, Gideon is a great story, and we're going to hear a, a big, uh, all of his story here today. But Gideon, if you ever read his story, it's in the book of Judges. Judges, if you want to turn to Judges chapter 6, that's where we're going to be at today. We're going to be Judges chapter 6, chapter 7, and it goes into chapter 8, but we're not going to get there just because of time-wise. But we're going to cover two chapters today. But there's a couple of things we've got to uh, understand before we go into Judges. The book of Judges records a dark time in the history of Israel. They have been in the promised land for some time, but while in the promised land, they have been introduced to pagan gods. And so sin enters. And because they're disobedient to God, God says, you know what? Anybody can come and conquer you guys. Go ahead, man. These people don't care for me. They don't care for me. They don't obey me. And so they do. People come in and, and, and conquer Israel. The book of Judges is about that time period. And we have to understand this time period and why it's written, how it's written, in order for us to interpret. The genre of this writing is called historical narrative, meaning it's a book that captures what happened back then. It's a book that was written telling us what happened back in the book of Judges. This is what happened. It's telling us a story. It's not telling us what to do. Does that make sense? So as we read the story, as we interpret it, it's, where, where, where it's not telling us what to do and how to live today. It's telling us, it's recording on what happened back then. And so we're going to interpret it in that sense. It's a historical narrative. And so we're going to read it 
through and through like a story. It's going to sound very much like a story. So as we interpret it, it's key that we understand what kind of writing it is. A lot of Paul's writing is telling us what to do. Judges is back in the Old Testament. It's historical. It's telling us what happened. And so we're going to see and we're going to read what happened. And then we will apply some needs and just how Gideon was back then. Okay. So as one reads the book of Judges, you will notice there's a cycle. There is a interesting cycle that occurs. The cycle begins with the people of Israel love God and they serve God. Okay. And then after they love God and serve God, they fall into sin. They compromise. Okay, then after they compromise, God allows a following nation to come and suppress them, conquer them. After they've been suppressed and oppressed for, for, for some time, the people of Israel cry out to God. They're like, save us. This sucks. Like, save us. We're sorry. So then God raises up a judge. He raises up a judge. That's why it's called the judges. He raises up a judge to free them from oppression and the people go back into loving God and serving God. So there's this, there's this cycle. That's what's happening in the book of Judges. And so we get to Judges chapter 6. We get to Judges chapter 6 and the people, we find the people in the cycle, they are crying out to God. Look at verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. So the people were doing whatever they wanted to do, and then God gave them over. All right, you're going to do whatever you want. Here, I'm going to let Midian come and conquer you guys. And so they do. They come in and they conquer them. So the question is, who is Midian? Who are they? Where are they from? Genesis chapter uh, 25, Midian, they are descendants of Abraham. Genesis 37, Joseph is sold to a group of people called the Midianites. In Exodus, when Moses runs away and he meets his future father-in-law, Jethro, Jethro is a Midian priest. So up to this point, the Midians are followers of God. They totally believe in God. They totally follow God. But in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, the Midianites, they team up, they team up with these guys called the Moabites who don't believe in God. And together, they bring all their finances, their resources together to hire this false prophet named Balaam. Balaam, the false prophet, introduces Midianites to Baal, the fertility god. Baal, the fertility god, their act of worship is orgies, sex. And so Midian, after that, never recovers after their sin. They never come back. In fact, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, right before uh, Judges, Midians are defeated. But here in chapter 6, they're back. And they're back strong. Look at verse 2. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So Midian's power was, was so great that the people of Israel ran and hid in the dens, in the caves, in the side of the mountains. Look at verses 3 and 4. For whenever the Israelites would plant crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance in Israel, and no sheep, ox, or donkey. So this is how devastating Midian is, that they'll, they'll come and destroy the farm, they'll kill all the animals, they'll destroy everything, leaving nothing. Folks, this is a different type of evil. You see, they could have came in and they could have just killed everyone, right? They could have just slaughtered everyone. But no, they were like, you know, we're going to leave everybody alive. We're going to destroy all their produce, all their animals. We're going to kill everybody. They're starving them from the inside out, killing them from the inside out. In fact, that's not, not even that. Look at verse 5. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels cannot be counted. That's how many there were. So that they laid waste the land as they came in. So not only were they powerful, they came deep. The author says, like locusts. They're strong. They came deep. Came like locusts. Then finally, look at verse 6. Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for the help 
to the Lord. So finally, Israel, being tired of being treated ruthlessly, they finally cry out to God. They finally cry out to God, God, we need your help. And so in verses 7 through 10, just skip over that. I'm going to paraphrase it for you guys. When they cry out to God, God hears them. And he's like, guys, like I led you out of Egypt. I delivered you out of Egypt. Like I, I told you not to worship other gods. I warned you about them, but you didn't listen. But God, who's gracious and merciful, Look at what he does in verse 11. He says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of Ophra, which belonged to Joash, the, the Bezerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So God, God hears their cry. God hears their struggling. God answers their prayer. And he sends them a deliverer. The angel shows up. He shows up to Gideon, who is beating wheat in a wine press, hiding from the Midianites. Gideon, what, what he's doing is he's threshing wheat, which sounds normal to people back then. But when you thresh wheat, you usually do it on the side of a, of a mountain so that when you're throwing it up and down, it, it, the, the, the shaft will be caught up in the air and, and blown away. What he's doing right here is he's threshing wheat in a wine press, a wine press that is enclosed, isolated. There's no space, no air. Why? Because the Midianites, he's scared. He was like, if, if I'm going to do this and the Midianites see it, they're going to come and take what we have. And so he's in a isolated, secure, um, secluded wine press. And that's where the angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon. Chapter 6, look at verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Yeah. So God shows up. Oh, the, the, the angel of the Lord shows up and he says, Gideon. The Lord's with you, O mighty man of valor. Valor means uh, courage, somebody who's brave in the face of danger. Most of the time it's used in battle. But Gideon, he's what? He's hiding out. He's in a wine press. He's, he's doing work that should be done out in the open. He's hiding out in a wine press. He ain't a mighty man of valor. He's not being brave. This is the opposite. In fact, church, what we see here is clearly what God sees in Gideon. You see, God doesn't see Gideon for who he is. God sees Gideon for who he's going to be. God doesn't see Gideon in his current state. God sees Gideon in his future being, the mighty man of valor who he will be. See, church, as God calls you and I to kingdom work, he doesn't call you, hey, man, like I want you to stay in, in, in your very state. No, he calls you to bigger and bigger, better things. He calls us forward. He doesn't want you to stay in the area you're staying right now. He calls you forward. He's calling Gideon, who was hiding out in a wine press. He calls him a mighty man of valor. Church, I don't know what God's calling you to do, but I know for a fact it's not in your current state right now. God wants you to be obedient to that. He wants you to be a kingdom worker. That's what he's calling you, and that's what he's calling Gideon right here. Look at verse 13. And Gideon said to him, this is how Gideon like, replies back to the Lord. He says, please, my Lord, if the Lord was with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where's all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian? Essentially, Gideon is like, come on, you're right. You ain't God. Where you been? Like, I've been told all these years about the great God that's taken us out of Egypt. Look at this, nothing. You're a fake God. That's what he's saying. He's saying that back to him because he feels that way. How many of us have felt that way? What we see here is Gideon's unbelief. Gideon's doubt and Gideon's lack of faith. Church, I know we have all been there. Some of us are sitting here right now, like doubt, little faith. 
Yet God's called you to, to kingdom work. And you question God. And you, you question God, God, how, how am I going to do this? Like, how, like why, why is this happening? When we're, as we're at, uh, questioning God, we're ignoring the fact that God is telling us to go be the very answer to the questions we ask. God's calling us to answer the very questions we ask, and he's using us. What's God asking you to do? What kingdom work has God tugged on your heart to be a part of? The one that you're questioning, ah, I'm, I'm not quite sure, God. The one that you, that you have doubts in. That's exactly how Gideon is feeling. Look at verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and he said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the, I'm the least in my father's house. Essentially, Gideon's like, man, how can I go? Like my crew, the village that I'm from, we're the weakest. In fact, I'm the smallest in my family. Like how, how am I going to go save Israel when I'm the weakest and the smallest in my family? And verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. Underline that. With all the questions that you and I have, with everything that we have, God says here, but I'll be with you. But I'll be with you. But God, my, my sister, she's not going to hear me. She, she's not going to hear me out when I talk about you, God. My coworkers, like they're, they're not going to accept anything. So I'm just not, it's okay. God says, I'll be with you. I will be with you. Church, whatever God has called you to do, you've got to trust he'll be with you. And trust doesn't come easy. Trusting in the Lord, it's hard. And so here are some three verses that you could totally just say out loud, that I say out loud when I begin to lose trust. Psalm 37 verse 5. Psalm verse 37 verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. I literally say, God, Here's Psalm 37, verse 5. I'm committing my way to you, God. You say, you say here that you're going to act. I'm committing to you. I'm trusting in you. That's what it says here in your word. Psalm 28, verse 7. I also say that the Lord is my strength and my shield. In my heart, it trusts. I am helped. My heart exults. And with a song, I give thanks to him. Those two psalms, I say back to the Lord. I say, God, I'm trusting in you. In my heart, I'm trusting in you. So whenever you doubt, whenever maybe you have questions, say those verses. There's a ton of other verses in, in Scripture that you could say out loud to the, to the Lord. But in those moments, read his word back to him. Now back to Judges chapter 6, verse 17. Now, this is Gideon. He, he said to him, I now have found favor in your eyes. Then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. And so Gideon is like, okay, I found favor in your eyes. But man, I, could you give me a sign? Could, could you give me a sign? Like, I, I, I want a sign. I want to be clear on who I'm talking to. So in verses 18 through 21, I'm going to paraphrase. You guys don't have to get there. Um, but Gideon makes an offering to the Lord. The angel of the Lord comes down. He absorbs the offering, accepts it. Then he disappears. And Gideon takes that as a sign. And look at verse 22. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon was like, alas! Oh, Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace be with you. A peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it. The Lord is peace. To this day, it still stands in Afra, which belongs to the Bezerites. After the sign, Gideon's faith grows. So much so, he builds an altar builds an altar, and worships. Now, verse 25, chapter 6. This is where it gets interesting. Gideon's first assignment. That night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold there, with the stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering, while the wood of Asherah that you shall, 
with the wood of Asherah that you shall cut down. So, okay, Gideon is, is confident in the Lord. He is pumped in the Lord. And God gives him his first assignment, which is to take down a altar, a false idol altar at his dad's house. So you would think you'd be like, yes, like I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. But I'm pretty sure he's scratching his head when he was like, oh, why has it got to be in my dad's house? <laughs> right? Like, wait, 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 why do I got to go to my dad's house? Like, can, can, can we do somebody else's house? Like, I go, I'll go do that first. Like, because everybody's all gangster when it's somebody else. But when it's in your own house, you kind of chicken out. God tells him, hey, go to your pop's house. Take down the false altar there. Use his own bulls to date, take down the altar there. And then his second bull, actually take that, kill it, and sacrifice it to me. Like, what a first assignment. You could tell Gideon wasn't all for it. Because look at Gideon in verse 27. Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord told him to. But <laughs> because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, look, what's he do? By night. By night. He does it at night. Like Gideon is so like me and so like all of us. Like we would find, like he didn't say when, <laughs> right? <laughs> like we, we totally wouldn't. So Gideon does. He, 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 he takes his 10 men. They do it at night when nobody's watching. Everybody's asleep. But in verses 28 through 32, I'm going to paraphrase. The people awake and they find out the altars turned down and they find out it was Gideon. And so all the men in the town want to kill Gideon. But then his very dad steps in. His dad steps in and be like, hey, no, no, no. If Baal, let, let Baal defend himself. Okay? So if, if Baal, Baal will take care of it. Thinking he would kill Gideon. That never happens. Gideon lives because Baal, like, he's not more powerful than God. So Gideon lives. Okay? Look at verse 33. Now, after this, all the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and they camped, they encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So the, the, the Midianites, the Malachites and all, they're all gathering. The army is gathering together to, to further invade, to further have a battle, even though they, they are still uh, conquered, even though the Midianites are conquering Israel. But look at verse 34. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet. And the Bezerites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers, in verse 35, throughout them all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, the Nephtali, and they all came up to meet with them. So Gideon is empowered by the Spirit. He sends out messengers. He makes a sound and gathers an army. And guess how many people show up? 32,000. 32,000 men show up. So you would assume that Gideon is like totally like jazzed about this, right? He was like, yes, I got 32,000 men. Oh, it's on, man. Like, like totally, we're totally going to win this war. But that's not how it goes. Look at verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. So Gideon, the doubter, like you can totally see how, how, how his unbelief just leads to this. He was like, ah, man, I got 32,000 men, but I'm not quite sure. So God, here's the test. And God answers him. So you'll think Gideon's faith is stronger, per se. Nope, look at verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Like, in other words, all right, God, don't, don't get mad at me, but can, can we do it again? Like, let, let me speak once more. He says, please let me test you once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece alone. Now the opposite. And on all the ground, let it there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece alone. And all the ground there was dew. So Gideon. Gideon. is confident now. 
He gets to the 32,000 men, but he wasn't fully convinced. He wasn't fully confident. He tests God twice, and now Gideon believes the faith he has in God is the strongest it's ever been. Gideon is now ready to go to war, but God has other ideas. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into to their hand. Least Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilad. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So God tells Gideon, all right, check this out. There's too many people here. You guys are going to go into war. You guys will win, and nobody will give glory to me. You, you, you guys will, will just boast about it. So tell the guys, whoever wants to go back home, tell them, go back home. Um, it, it's all good. And so Gideon steps up and says, all right, whoever is scared, all right, whoever wants to just go home to their, uh, their family, go home. You're good to go. So you think like, you know, 1,000, 1,500, maybe the most 2,500. No, 22,000 men go back home. 22,000 men. Could you imagine how Gideon's feeling now? Like he's already, yeah, the unbelief and the doubt that he carries. And so you could, you could just picture him right now. 22,000, he's probably like, dang, Ooh, like, you know, kind of calm, trying to calm him down. Like, okay, 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 I could do 10,000. I can do 10,000. No, look at what he says in verse 4, chapter 7, verse 4. God comes back. The Lord said to Gideon, the people, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number, and the number of those who lap, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people who knelt down to drink the water. And the Lord said, Gideon said to them, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go back home. In other words, God says, all right, take your, take your 10,000 men to this water. Whoever kneels down, bends over and drinks like a dog, okay? Drinks like a dog, send them home. Whoever takes the knee and uses their hand and drinks, in other words, they're, they're, they're the real warriors. They're the one who drinks looking up still. They're the ones who, who you want. The ones who, who bend down like a dog, the, the dog, you get them home. They're, they're not warriors. Send them home. And so he does. 9,700. 9,700 soldiers go back home. 300. Gideon is left with the original 300. Not the movie that's come out, you know. No, this is the original 300. Gideon's 300. That's all that's left. 32,000 to 300. So could you imagine just what's going on in Gideon's mind? What's going on in his heart? He's probably asking all kinds of questions. But then in verse 9, 9 through 14, God reassures Gideon. God tells him to go with his servant to a, to, down to the camp. And while they're there, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, they overhear a soldier telling another soldier that God is going to, Use Gideon to defeat the Midianites. And Gideon responds in verse 15 by worshiping God. And so in verse 16, look at what confident Gideon does. Verse 16 of chapter 7, he says, He divided the 300 men into three companies. He put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look to me and do likewise. When I come down to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. So he divides them in groups of 100 each, surround them and give them a trumpet, a torch, and an empty jar. And he tells them, all right, be ready. Do as I do. Verse 18, when I blow the trumpet, this is Gideon, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and Gideon. Now, for Gideon right there, just Circle it and put a, uh, put a question mark next to it. If we got time at the end, we'll, I'll come back and address that. 
But Gideon and his 300 men, uh, they, they surround the Midianites and the, Mac, the, the Malachites. They surround them. And then when Gideon blows his trumpets, everybody else blows their trumpets. They take their jars. They start smashing it together. And what happens, this is happening at night, is the camp arises. They think they're getting attacked. They think that with all the noises, with the trumpets and the jars clashing together, they think that there are people already there. So they pull out their swords and they start fighting each other. They start killing each other. So a majority of them kill each other while others run away. People get in way. In fact, two kings get away. And so that battle was an amazing battle. And then when you get to chapter 8, we're not going to get there. We're not going to look at the verses, but if you want to later on today... When you get to chapter 8, Gideon pursues the rest of the Midians, which included the two kings of Midian. And after a series of pursuit, battle, pursuit, battle, pursuit, and battle, Gideon, in verse 21, kills the two kings of Midian, defeating the Midians, delivering Israel from the Midianites. Israel is no longer under the oppression of the Midianites. And remember the cycle? Israel goes back to loving God and being obedient to God. Gideon, a man of little faith, yet God takes him all that he is, all the tests that he gives, all the questions that he is, and God calls him to kingdom work, and kingdom steps up to the plate. He becomes a kingdom worker. With all the doubts, all the question, he leads the army. He's obedient to God, and he does kingdom work. Church, that's what he's called you and I to do. With all the questions that we have, all the doubts that we have, all the like feeling just unqualified that we are. God has called you and I to further his kingdom. God has called you and I to kingdom work. And so he specifically placed you where you live, what you do for fun, where you uh, play, and the community that you're in. He placed you specifically there to further his kingdom. He also gave you time, treasures, and talents so that you you can use it to further his kingdom. The question is, will you respond? Or will you disobey? You see, what we learn here from Gideon specifically is to take courage in the Lord. It took a series of events For Gideon to finally have confidence in the Lord. What if we didn't have to go through those things? I get it. I get that we have to go through the hard things sometimes just so we can see and have that full perspective. But as as the way this book is written, it's a historical narrative. It's telling us what happened. We would be dumb to not learn from Gideon. And so instead of waiting a while to have confidence in the Lord, what if we did so today? You see, some of us, God has called us to do kingdom work for a long time. For some of us, the very kingdom work God has called to us is our very spouse. And we've denied that. For some of us, the very kingdom work God's called to us is our very children. And we said, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. For some of us, God is calling you to something right now. Some of you guys are starting your, your, maybe your careers right now, whatever it may be. You probably moved homes. And God's fresh, freshly calling you to do something you've never done before. Whatever God's calling you to do, know this. Paul tells this to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says this, I am sure of this. This is what Paul says to the people that he's saying to us here today. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, who he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So whatever God has called you to do and to be, he is going to see it through. So as much as you kick and fight and run the opposite way like Jonah, 
God's going to complete it through you. I was just telling somebody yesterday, they're like, hey, so how long have you been wanting, wanting to be a pastor? I said, man, I'm still fighting it. Seriously, like being a pastor is not really like, man, I can't wait to be a pastor. Like that's no. Seriously. It's, it's, not, it's not something like, man, I, I dreamt about when I was young. But I feel the most alive as a pastor. And so whatever it is that God calls you to do, you're probably going to kick and you're going to fight. But when you're in the midst of it, you're probably going to feel the best you've ever felt. Because God knows you more than you even know yourself. So what is it? So what's God calling you to do? He's not saying, man, like if, if he's calling you to go overseas, be obedient, go overseas. But if he's calling you just to walk over from one lunch table to the other, you be obedient to that. It's the same. That's essentially what Gideon did. He was obedient. There was nothing special about Gideon. Really, there was nothing special. It was all God. And remember earlier I said, uh, circle Gideon's name when it says, when, when Gideon said, for the Lord and for Gideon, that's what he said. That's what he was telling the army. That's a little black eye for Gideon. You see, 40 years from this day, Gideon creates an ephod. Ephod is, a, is an outer layer garment that he told everybody, hey, bring me all your, your, your earrings and, and jewelry and stuff. And he makes an ephod and, and he wears it. When he makes it, everyone, it says in God's word, it says everybody hoard after it. That ephod became a stumbling block. And then the people of Israel went, fought, fell into sin and they fell into oppression under another nation. So Gideon is a kingdom worker, but he's just like us. We could totally distract people from God's kingdom too. So which one would you be? Gideon, the way you're going to be, be like Gideon and, 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 and totally just trust in the Lord and take courage in the Lord and be, be intentional about not compromising because that's what happens to Gideon later on. But the, to be honest, if you follow Gideon, Gideon, you eventually fail. Follow Jesus. The greatest kingdom worker of all time. Who handled his kingdom work. To the T. Who showed up and he said, God said, man, I'm going to send you to the earth and I'm gonna, you're going to die. He goes, okay. He comes in the earth and he walks his earth and he handles it. He becomes the greatest kingdom work of all time. And his work allowed all of us, his work on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, allows you and I to be kingdom workers. If he never dies on the cross, we will never be here. We will never be called to kingdom work. And so if there is somebody we look up to, in fact, we have to. We are to imitate Christ, not Gideon. We, we learn from Gideon, but we imitate Christ. That's who we follow. And so as you walk in this life, as you live it out, imitate Christ. Take courage like Gideon did, but it's Jesus Christ who you follow.